<laughs> Good day, everybody. How's it going? Uh, welcome to the Make Music Income podcast number 15. My name is Stevie B. I'm here with my friend and co-host, Eric Copeland of MakeMusicIncome.com. This episode is brought to you by the Production Music Academy. Go check that out at the theproductionmusicacademy.com. And today we are talking about all things music production related. We're going to talk about uh, our DAW, our go-to sounds. We're going to talk about our production process, how long it takes to finish tracks, uh, all those things. So uh, before we get into it, Eric, how was your week? What's been going on? It's good. Uh, it's been it's been going pretty good. Um, I have um, just done, as you know, my first live video as we are taping this. I, yeah, I did that this morning, and it went really well. It was a lot of fun, and lots of people showed up. I was so excited, and uh, we talked sync licensing. You know, it's something that we don't talk about that much because there's no results we have necessarily between us yet on really sync licensing to film television and stuff. I mean, I'm after all that stuff. You're you're about to get after it and um I, I've got stuff going on in it. But I thought it was it's it was good for the channel to start to go ahead and um and really put that into action. And I wanted to create content that I didn't have to edit. As you know, lives are better when you don't have because you don't really have to edit them. I mean, you could, I guess you could, but um, yeah, you, yeah, that's it. I mean, you don't, yeah, no editing necessary. I, I was, I was there for most of it. It was great. There was lots of people in there. I was, I was, uh, you know, so, um, stoked to see all the, 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 the questions. There's there was almost, it, I felt like you were having a hard time keeping up with all of the, all the comments and the questions. Well, I wanted to be careful that I didn't just have to sit there and wait for questions. So I, I prepared a lot of stuff to talk about yeah, before that. And I, I always will, because I think that's a better way to fill it out. That's smart. And, uh, and, uh, but I think I was able to get to everybody and um, they weren't, I didn't feel it was too fast. I mean, sometimes I just let the questions hang while I finish my section. And that's the way I wanna do the live. I don't wanna do it where I'm like, so anybody else got any questions? You know, I, I want to just be be talking and that's not hard for me to do. So I just I just had my notes <laughs> just like I do for our our thing here. And I'll just I just keep them up there. And I had written it and I, I didn't read it, but I, I pretty much used it as a script and then uh, answered questions. As I went along and that's what we're going to do every week. It'll just be about something different. Uh, every week, whatever I think I need to be talking about. And this might be a way to get to other topics that I want to talk about, like publishing, like uh, teaching, like different things like that, you know, where I can get into that. And, 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 um, and you know, it's balanced because you and I, ha we talk about things here. Um, I have my own videos, you have your own videos. And so not repeating too much of the same thing all the time can be a, an issue. But mm -hmm. uh, there's two things this week I really want to talk about. And I put up a, a thing on my channel, a poll, and I said, I'm either going to talk about content ID or sync licensing. Which one do you want? Yeah. And it was 80% sync licensing. Yeah. And so I said, okay, I need to do sync licensing. But I had written the content ID video. And so I shot the content ID video Monday. I'll be editing it this this week, and it'll come out this weekend. And I, and I think that's just going to be kind of the schedule. The, the podcast on Mondays, whether it's on your channel or mine, the uh, live on Thursdays, and then a, a, an edited vi video on the weekends. I like doing the weekends, I like that. especially Sunday. I love Sunday morning. I think people are hungry for content because they haven't had any because nobody really puts anything out on the weekends. So yeah, well the the premiere that you, like you put out last Sunday was it last Sunday that mm, you premiered some couple Sundays ago. Couple Sundays ago. Yeah. yeah, there was lots of people in there for that too, and I was uh, I was kind of pleasantly surprised because I'm always not too sure how much how many people are are engaged on the weekend but it seems like um yeah you got a point there that there's um definitely some interest uh, people are just kind of hanging around on their day plus off. i i think i don't know if that was weekend or not but i know it was the pond five video and i knew that yeah. one was going to be a hot hot button right you know because uh and it's it's still doing very well and it's going to be one of those videos that does well because of search right and uh but everybody is whenever you do a cover a specific music library everybody wants to jump on and find out any secrets that you've got on that so totally. um so yeah today was sync licensing and then uh let's see what else has been going on uh this week i've been trying to finish uh, doing more on the country album 
that we're working on for Sony BMG. And uh, I pitched a song yesterday to, through my uh, library, one of my libraries. He came to me with a specific uh, pitch in England for a advertising spot. I think it's only a 30 second spot, mm -hmm. but very specific piano jazz, jazzy kind of piano thing. And he thought of me and he came to me. And so I, I pulled off a few things and he used one of them and sent it uh, along with another thing he had. And so uh, that's, that's the, the job of uh, presenting to a brief, which uh, you're going to get into here in just a minute when you talk about, uh, well, you're going to, I don't know if you're going to talk about your, your new challenge, but. Um, yeah, actually, I, I'll, that's I'll, I'll add that to the list. <laughs> yeah, see, uh, but uh, you know, that, that's always interesting when one of my libraries calls me about a brief and mm -hmm. uh, it just so happened that, but I, I did as I always do and I put it off to the last minute and then I had to go teach. Uh, I'm teaching lessons sometimes on some afternoons. So uh, I kind of, I kind of just didn't, I kind of just put something together that I thought, I mean, it wasn't very complicated what he, what he needed. So, uh, but he used one of them. So that's good. And uh, let's see what else, anything else this week? Uh, not really. I've been putting stuff up to, uh, I finished a, uh, oh, I know. I finished a, a piece for uh, Stevie B's um, uh, challenge <laughs> and turned it into him yesterday morning in, just in time for his uh, his presentation of all things. And he didn't see my email. So uh, nobody's heard it. <laughs> Now, you know, um, <laughs> as we talked about offline, I did put, uh, I actually did put a little time in that. I, I, I have. Uh, I heard it. It was great. I wish, I, yeah. <laughs> we'll have to, I'll have to feature it retroactively uh, somehow. Well, I have to send stuff through smoke signal or something. Next time. But <laughs> yeah. um, uh, See, I'm one of those guys that I try not to look at through my, or I try not to dig in too hard on, to my emails first thing in the morning. It just stresses me out. So I wish you had texted me and told me that you had submitted. Talk about a last minute submission over here. Well, you didn't air until three o'clock. <laughs> yeah, your time. I, I said it like six hours before. <laughs> your time. I'm three anyway, hours earlier here. Anyway, uh, I am going to be using that for uh, an upcoming Hello Composers thing called nice. Hello Lamentations. And, um, but I tell you what, with logic, as we'll talk about today, you're not very limited uh, in what you can do. Uh, and I knew that when I when I was going to put this thing together for this challenge, which was about only using the sounds of your DAW, that mm -hmm. I was going to dig into strings event at some point in the song. You know, and it, I started with a piano thing, and then I I kind of moved into some electronics, and then added brought in orchestral elements. And boy, was it. I was really impressed by I, the, I was imp I like uh, man I was just blown away because I've been using this old version of logic um, and I don't have much of any kind of stock sounds uh, on it I have like the very you know just very basic stuff because um, I didn't install any of it and uh, man the orchestral stuff has really improved uh, over time yeah. on logic it's it, articulations it, it, where you can do the tremolo things mm -hmm. you know and 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 oh, gosh I, I was just blown away and so um, but you got to dig. And, and it takes time to dig, yeah. you know? And so I probably approached it a couple times in three different days where I did the piano thing first and said, oh, that's kind of pretty. It's like we've talked about on this channel before my composing process, and we'll talk about that today. But yeah. it's usually, yeah. I, I, I write an outline, and I come back and say, is it good enough? And then the second day I'll go, it's not really good enough, but I'll keep working on it. And then the third day I'll go, hey, it's not bad. I'll finish it out. And then, <laughs> so that's kind of the way it happened. And I was happy with it. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to pitch it to Crucial music who is more of a they seem to like orchestral things the cinematic stuff cinematic stuff and so yeah it's, and, and i'm also going to score it i mean i'm going to reverse score it to video um uh, for my composer channel because it's kind of got some some trailer type uh feel to it and i'd like to practice that a little bit so I'll nice be doing that nice so that and teaching <clears throat> and just working for clients and that's been my week how about you um, yeah, it's been a fun week. I, uh, like you mentioned the, uh, the, I announced the March challenge for the Academy, uh, yesterday, and it's all about, uh, practicing pitching to briefs, speaking of briefs. So I guess I'm kind of taking on, uh, Michael Laskow's sort of, uh, role within the Academy and I'll be the, uh, call it like lift instead yeah. of taxi. Maybe. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I'll just call it cab or something. Anyway. Um, so 
yeah, I put I uh, I made kind of like five mock briefs, uh, and they're all in uh, interesting different uh, genre. One one of them is like an '80s synth wave track, and the other one's like a uh, one of them's dramedy. Um, and there's anyway, there's five. There's a lo-fi. Then there's a lo-fi one, yeah. Um, and I'm hoping that the uh, the members will kind of uh, attempt to create a track that's like not in their wheelhouse. Yeah. Um, that would be uh, you know. The, the, the best way to approach the challenge. Um, the members seem excited about it, and uh, I am too. I think I'm going to try to create an 80s synth wave because I don't think I've ever really tackled that um, properly. So I'm going to dive into that. And uh, yeah, the uh, f- for whoever <clears throat> caught the live stream um, yesterday, I had a ton of fun with that, just showcasing yeah, everyone's work from um, from uh, you know the from last month's challenge, which was to create something uh, using nothing but stock DAW um, uh, sounds and and instruments. And man, just uh, it just totally blew me away. The uh, the the all everyone's submission was absolutely fantastic. It was so varied um, in terms of the the genres and the styles too. Uh, it really was inspiring for me to hear it. And um, yeah, it made me realize that, uh, well, yeah, another th- another thing I had in my new, uh, little, you know, week here is that I've mentioned this on the live stream too, is that I got a new Mac mini in the mail. I should be getting that. Ooh, you um, got it. Yeah, I bought it. I bought the new M1 uh, mini and uh, I'll just upgrade to the M2 whenever they whenever they put it out. But um, yeah, I'm really excited. I should be getting it Monday, and I'm gonna I'm just gonna yeah upgrade everything. I'm gonna install um, the new version of Logic and uh, all and include all the the stuff that comes with it. Um, and uh, yeah, doing a big a big upgrade over here uh, with uh, with that. So I'm excited. Um, it's gonna take a lot of work, you know, as it always as as it always does reinstalling all the plugins and everything like that but um i'm getting pre-organized for that so uh that's kind of what uh, has, has been taking up a lot of my time this week Reorga- reorganizing my hard drives um and and all that kind of stuff so <clears throat> the um yeah what else is going on this week i also put out march's course i'm actually for once in my life i'm kind of ahead of schedule i usually it usually takes me like you know somewhat into the first week or second week of the month before i release the month's course but i did it on the i actually released it on february 28th um so i'm a bit ahead of schedule it is a it is a course about dramedy and i've been writing a ton of these tracks lately and uh like i mentioned yesterday too it it has been a great way for me to sort of just um I don't know. Keep my my spirits high. Say I I feel like composing is therapeutic for for me, mm-hmm. and um, it's nice to just kind of uh, get into a sort of comical and lighthearted vibe. And dramedy tracks are so easy to write. They're they're really yeah. quite easy um, and and simple um, to write. And you can get a bunch of these tracks done really quickly. Um, that's what the course is all about. Um, and uh, I have a little template. And I, I've just gone to town, and I've, I've written a, a couple of uh, dramedy tracks, and now this, um, you know, the, the members in the academy are doing the same thing, and it's it's been a lot of fun. So um, that course is live in the academy. It's live on Teachable as well. Uh, it's only twenty bucks this month, uh, so uh, go check that out if you guys feel so inclined. And uh, what else is going on? Uh, Nancy, my girlfriend, is working on a um, an application for Artlist, and I'm going to help her with that. Um, pretty excited to kind of help her produce that uh she but, writes because she, she's a musician yeah she's a she's a great pianist um she does a lot of like classical music stuff but she also writes kind of like i don't know how you describe it it's kind of lo-fi ish like instrumental uh music you can you can check out her soundcloud page at uh, nancy leticia does she have her own rig or does she do you let your her you use your no no she has her own she has her own thing uh she just uses her laptop and she has like a little midi keyboard um yeah. as well and uh really yeah really lightweight kind of setup um which is something that we'll talk about uh <laughs> in this podcast actually yeah. um but uh yeah i'm gonna help her uh, produce that and get an application together and uh, she's excited about that and um yeah wh- one other thing that i'm really really excited about this month is that uh i got lester uh signed on for a track breakdown for the academy this month so this is a new kind of um uh, a topic that i've added to the academy uh, last month and uh, I'm basically, it, I've been sharing some of my tracks. And I'm just breaking them down. Like what, you know, 
uh, everything I use from the, the, the plugins, libraries to my process in creating a track. It's, we just take one track uh, and then just completely um, disassemble it and break it down. And uh, I've been, uh, yeah, getting other producers to to kind of sign on to this um, to this program too. And I'm hopefully going to get, you know, one or two a month um, into the academy. And I'm, I'm, it's just going to be open to um, all all sorts of, uh, you know, all producers out there, including yourself. I'd love to have you um, on board for that. And uh, it's just kind of an I've interview. I've got this track I just made this week for a guy who uh, was doing a challenge. Mm-hmm. So um, it was called, uh, it was called From a Parallel Earth. So if you're interested I heard about in that, that one. one. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is the title of Eric's track. So, so uh, you're hired and uh, we'll, we'll work something out uh, off, off the air. Um, no, but I, I, uh, I got Lester to, to, uh, to agree to, to, to do it. And so we're, we're connecting next, uh, next Sunday. I, I would and, love to see his sessions. And also yeah. the other, another guy you should get is Mojo. Yeah, well, we've been talking. Uh, Mo- Mojo is is uh, is on board too, uh, but he is um, he's got a tricky setup with uh, with uh, like his he's um, like in terms of Zoom share and everything like that. It's a little bit tricky, but and actually the same thing was the case for Lester, uh, except for what he's doing is he's sending me the stems of his track, and then I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna have them on my end and screen share them and then ask well, I him. I think that's what you should do yeah. with everybody. Can't, I, I think so. Is Lest, is Mojo on Logic? or what's Yeah, he's it? a Logic user. Yeah. So, I mean, he should just be able to send you a Logic session too. And if, if all else fails, just print everything. I think it's know? the way to go because I think not everybody is set up properly to screen share with like, yeah. uh, with Zoom and everything like that. It's a little bit, it's, it's asking a lot of the people I'm interviewing. So, yeah, um, yeah it's easier for me to do it because I'm, I'm fully set up to do that kind of thing. But uh, anyway, I've been doing it. Uh, I'm opening it up to uh, other producers too. And uh, I'm really excited about that. I think it's like, it's something new for the Academy that people are getting a ton of value from. So um, I've already done one already and it's gone well. So that's cool. it for me, man. I don't know that that was my, that was my week. I'm not sure if there's anything else to, to chat about. All right, man. Well, you want to get into today's let's get into it subject. Yeah. Um, you know, I think this is interesting. We're going to talk about our music production equipment and processes and uh those cat action going on over there but um you know i i keep and i know you do too i i think that someone asked me today in the live if premium expensive high-end speakers are important. i saw i saw that yeah and i that was such, such a great question I you have know, so many and, on that. Uh, and I think, the, and I said, you know, we're, they're not. Um, the, some of the worst mixes I've ever done were on great, big, expensive Gentle X mm-hmm. that did not translate out of the room at all. Yeah. You know, and now once you get your ears att- attuned to what you're producing in those Gentle X or these, these like ter- very, not terrible, but um, low end JBL speakers that they sell at every guitar center, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, th- once you get attuned to what they sound like there and learn how that translates out into the world, you know what it's going to, it's going to be. So it's not going to be that different in here or in my other headphones that are like, you know, that block the rest of the world out and I can really hear. And so, mm-hmm. um, I don't think having a great big studio is necessarily, obviously we're all here in our homes. Even in Nashville, everybody is working in their homes. Every engineer that I know, while they still might get called to a gig at a large studio to track, rarely is there any mixing going on at on 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 big consoles as much anymore. Every engineer is working in the box, which even ten years ago was a question mark. Should we work in the box? Yeah. And, well, and, and these Grammy-winning engineers in Nashville were saying should can I transfer into the box because I'm so used to, you know, a, a, a beautiful, uh, huge console mix. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, the d- digital, uh, uh, digital, uh, universe is long caught up with, uh, with the analog and, um, long since caught up and, uh, and as some of the greatest mix engineers out there are, are fully in the box. Now you want to start with our equipment and just kind of say, what do you have? Yeah, Man. so um, I'll start with mine. I uh, I like to keep my you know things real simple over here. I, I use a Mac Mini. Um, 
For my computer, I have uh, an Apollo Twin uh, for an interface, and um, I use uh, my Audio Tech Technica headphones, um, AT fifties, um, I think, and um, those are kind of the mid-range ones. And then I have a bunch of guitars, and uh, I have uh, you, you know have I, have, a keyboard. You have, I have I have a, yeah, oh, I have a keyboard. keyboard, I have an M Audio uh, keyboard, which kind of stinks. It's not great. Um, I have a uh, a Rode NT150 uh, wide diaphragm condenser microphone that I use to record my guitars, and I have uh, two Slate pencil condenser mics, um, which I which I bring out occasionally, and then I have this one that I'm talking into uh, right now, this Shure. So um, that's it, man. I mean, like that's the extent of my arsenal. Other than that's like my actual hardware uh, arsenal. I mean, like uh, other than my guitars and stuff, right? Like I, you know, have, I yeah. basically have spent most of. Um, I mean, and my guitars are really not uh, anything super special. I mean, I love them, but they're they're not it's like, like you got a. Is that a Fender bass back there? Yeah, it's a Squire uh, P yeah, bass. A Squire P bass, <clears throat> and okay. I have a Fender Jazzmaster next to that. Okay. An Epiphone acoustic, and I have a I have a classical, um, a Yamaha uh, classical that guitar. Mando small. or something down. Yeah, there? I have a, a like a no name mandolin. I don't even know okay. what the make of it is, um, cool. but uh, and that's it, man. I have a, I have some other guitars uh, buried away in in storage as well. I have like a. Um, uh, another Stratocaster and, and, and a few th uh, ones that I don't really use that often. I have a Harmony, like a hollow body. Um, but yeah, my, I, I, I'm a guitarist. So, you know, I've, I've invested in, uh, in guitar options. Uh, but otherwise my, uh, uh, my setup is incredibly, you know, simple, straightforward. Well, when I moved into this room, I moved from having like a desk like a an Omni Racks desk, you know, that was meant for mixing and stuff like that, and had uh, like a natural mix console, really like... nice event. No, it wasn't. It was just a a desk made for oh sorry a keyboard and speakers and rack gear right. and stuff like that. Right. And I had had that for about since about the early two thousands, and um, so. That was for me uh, my my rack, uh, my my desk, and then I ha always have had keyboards. I'm a keyboard guy, so like you have guitars hanging around, I have keyboards hanging around. Right mm -hmm. now, I have um, this keyboard, which is the brand newest one, and my dog, which wants to go out, which I'm gonna have to do, go let her out because my daughter just left. But um, <laughs> so there's my dog, and she's uh, trouble. But this keyboard <laughs> is growing on me. This new keyboard I just got. That's a uh, M Audio Hammer 88 Pro. Yeah. I'm going to be doing a review on that some, sometime soon. And then I've got this keyboard, which is a Native Instruments uh, S61, which ties into all my Native Instrument things, which is really nice. And then on this side, it's just this, you know, two speakers and a monitor and a, and a Mac Mini. Are those uh, a and Yamaha then I have, monitors? Or? Uh, no, these are JBLs. Oh, JBLs, yeah. Uh, the JBL ones I was telling you about. Um, yeah. And they're they're... I think the fives or something like that, maybe the threes. And then this Air, M, M Audio Air. I'm a big M Audio guy right now for apparently, for, for some reason. Right. All right, so my computer's going crazy. So, um, and then uh, on on here, this is a, a, a AT2035 a or 4035, one of those. Cool. Do you use... Like when you're writing music, is it most often you're listening through monitors or are you, are you listening through headphones? When I'm using keys, I prefer headphones just because I can hear better. And with this new controller, it, it feels more natural to use headphones to listen to play piano mm -hmm. because it's really thunky. But it's it feels perfect when I've got headphones on and I'm playing Keyscape. But if I'm if I'm trying to play through the speakers, since I'm over here and the speakers are over here... I'm not getting, uh, I don't feel it as much, and it feels more like playing a MIDI keyboard versus having headphones on. So yeah. the answer is both, and the answer is what time is it? So if it's at night and my wife's in bed and I'm mixing something, I'm in headphones. But if it's right, if it's right now and nobody's here, I am mix it. I'll, I'll listen to uh, the mix in, in speakers, but I can use headphones either way. It doesn't matter. Um, and, and you have to... Sometimes you have to do both, especially with vocals. And I do a lot of mixing with vocals. And vocals mix differently in headphones than they do speakers. So you kind of have to use both. I find that mixing in these cheaper kind of uh, speakers, mm -hmm. and these are just Guitar Center JBL 
it's whatever they're selling a lot right now. It's they're kind of an engineer in Nashville told me about them and they're fine. They're but to get a decent mix, you really have to work, and and it, so it makes me work harder than the, than the headphones do. Which these are like three thousand level the HD third three eighty Pro Sennheisers. They were like two or three hundred dollars. Right. So they're good. They're higher end headphones for for this kind of work, and um, but the the JBLs make me work harder. The speakers make me work harder because I'm dealing with space issues like. This is a weird room. It's not meant for mixing. I do have some stuff on the walls. And I think that's another big deal. It doesn't look like you have much sound absorption in there. Do you have any? No, I got in none. Your room? I got a plant. I got my <laughs> fern plant. Boy, they really suck up the, <laughs> the sound, those ferns. But um, I, these actually do. They, they help quite a bit in this room And when before I came in here. but And this is an odd, like oddly shaped room that goes out into the, the patio. Um, off of our bedroom and then into the house. But um, you're always going to have that. You're going to have that wherever you are. You're going to have weirdly shaped rooms. Sometimes you're not going to have the perfect square room to put a table in. Yeah, look, I mean. Put baffling behind you and all that kind of stuff. It's never going to be perfect, you know. Like, uh, there's, I mean, if I if I had unlimited resources, like, I would build, like, the perfect studio, you know, of course. But, I, I mean, all the equipment in the world, all the, like, the, the sound treatment and all the, you know, the most expensive monitors won't save you. Um, if you don't, you know, understand how to, how to mix properly. Um, and I think that's what it really comes down to is I think, I think a, a lot of people get wrapped up in this idea that like, you know, a better microphone, um, better equipment, uh, better, everything is gonna, is gonna help. But like that, I think it's so important to just come back to the fundamentals of like, like, you know, understanding how to balance the mix out properly. And if you can do that, um, and you have, uh, you know, I, I use my laptop uh, as my number one reference speaker. Um, I listen to a ton of music and just everything through my laptop. I consume a lot of content through my laptop. I understand those speakers very, very, very well. So, um, you know, if I'm renting something on my headphones and I bounce it off, listen to it my, my, uh, through my MacBook speakers, then I instantly know what's wrong with it. Uh, and I can go back into the session and fix that, uh, fix those problems so that it sounds good on, I on don't all sorts of different speakers. I don't subscribe to the theory that you should mix lo-fi. In other words, you, uh, uh, that mixing a great sound is not necessary and that you should mix uh, to your, I know guys who literally mix to their phone. And while I know a lot of people listen that way, I still know also a lot of people are listening to, to earbuds of all different qualities, including high quality, and they're listening on cars, and they're listening on boom boxes, and they're listening on on TVs, and they're listening everywhere. So, and, and sound bars, you know, and they're listening with all sorts of things. Some people are listening in their studios with speakers, but it should be noted that as while we're talking about equipment, and this is this is not software, this is equipment. I have, you have a Mac. You don't, you haven't even hooked up your new M1 yet. You have a Mac Mini 2017, did you say? 2018. I have a Mac Mini 2014. And we have both been doing a lot of work with these old computers, mm -hmm. you know? And so the 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 I can't I can't have any success if I unless I have the newest M1 uh laptop. Does it make any sense? It no. doesn't hold. Um, we just proved that you can make a, a really great music with just your DAW and no other plugins. Yeah, in your challenge, totally. So it's uh, you could make. Uh, uh, we talked about another possible challenge where you could use no equipment other than your found your found sounds, your guitars behind you, my piano in the other room, my grand piano, mm -hmm. my voice. Um, yeah, what if you just did it and you couldn't use any plugins whatsoever or any sounds on your DAW whatsoever? It yeah. all had to be through mic. You know, and through mic yeah. and that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be a great challenge. We were or talking plug in. About... I would allow plug in of a of a of an acoustic instrument, you know, like a guitar right. or a bass. Right. Um or, or something like that. But yeah, that would be an interesting challenge too. But that's, you know, equipment I, I also have a grand piano in the other room, but I don't use it for recording. Because I don't keep it as tuned as it should be, and it's it's too much trouble to record when I have Keyscape, and we'll get into that in a minute. Mm -hmm. So, 
yeah, I think just coming back to like the, yeah, my, I just have a philosophy of, um, you know, not letting yourself get wrapped up in the idea that like, uh, you need better equipment. Like I, I, I've never convinced myself that I need these things. It's like, you know, um, I think that came f about through, uh, from just going through, uh, audio engineering school because there was just endless, endless discussion about like, oh, but no, you need like, you know, uh, like this mic, like, you know, you got to get oh. that Neumann mic to get like that perfect, mm. uh, vocal mix. And it's like, no, it's like it, forget all that stuff, man. It all comes down. It's, it's all about the performance. It's all about the, 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 the inputs. Um, it's all about the arrangement, how you're, how you're organizing the sounds. It's all about the source material, uh, that you're putting into your tracks that makes the real difference. Um, that can be managed and executed brilliantly with extremely minimal equipment. I mean, there's, yep. there is people making unbelievable music with uh, just on their laptops and, and headphones and people got to re remind themselves of that. Not saying that, you know, if you don't have the budget to go buy some, you know, new, uh, brand new speakers or like some, you know, and level up the, the, the gear that you had, like go for it, do it. Um, I, you know, if I had, if I had a bigger budget, I'd be, I'd have a proper studio. I would, you know, like I, with sound treatment and everything I would. Um, but I, I've just, I really think it's important for people to get out of the, the mindset of convincing themselves that they need that stuff before they get started. Just, you know, just, just get started, go do it. You know, the guy that I interviewed and we, inter I interviewed, we had on our podcast about, uh, Dan Barracuda mm -hmm. is, uh, he, he plays guitar only. I mean, I, I know he does other things, but for the majority of what he has been paying his rent through Spotify with and what he just got accepted to Motion Array with and now is doing very well there and just accepted the music fine and just accepted the scorekeepers is two guitar passes. Right? Yeah. That, a guitar, like a chordal version and a melody version. Yeah. And that's it. There's nothing else, and I think, I can't remember, he uses Pro Tools, I believe, and uh, it's just a mic and a guitar. Yeah, man. And so, you know, yeah, you just can't say that, oh man, I don't have enough, I don't have the equipment. Now, mm -hmm. now, yeah, you need to get something decent mic-wise to record good vocals, and it has to probably cost over $100. Probably over there 100 are, bucks, yeah. There are $100 microphones, though, still. You can go over to Best Buy and get a, uh, you know, some of these blue mics. And yeah, like, and do I, I don't recommend the USB, uh, like, condenser mics, but they're they're not they're not that bad. They're not that bad. It'd be a place bad, to start. You know? It's a good place to start, and I, I totally agree, and that's a good point. I think, like, my, my Rode NT1 cost 300 or 400 bucks. Uh, at the time, and it's lasted me over ten years, and it's a fantastic microphone. Um, microphones, the sky's the limit, man. You can go get like you know vintage Neumann microphones that cost like ten thousand dollars plus. Um, but and it's like you know some of those microphones are amazing, uh, but I really yeah I don't think that you need to spend much more than a few hundred bucks to get a really solid condenser yeah, but... microphone that's going to be sufficient for recording uh, acoustic instruments or voice or whatever you want to do with it. Definitely. And, and this this kind of AT mic is only a couple hundred bucks, I think. Right. And they're great microphones for people who are just doing some vocal recording and stuff like this. I've done tons of albums with this, and then I have another Marshall type mic, you know, that was rather inexpensive. I think it was 100 to 200 bucks or so. Mm -hmm. And it, I've been using that for over 10 years, and it's great mic for guys especially. But yeah, you don't have to go crazy. Okay, so let's move on with uh, processes. You want to go to process now? Yeah. So I'm going to release a video on um, my YouTube channel. This is one of those rare videos where I actually took the time to like do some, like some fancy editing to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Inspired by your videos. Um, yeah. A lot of jump cuts and stuff. Uh, <laughs> I'm a jump anyway. cutter. Yeah. So I, this Serial video is jump cutter. <laughs> this video is going to be, uh, it's, it's basically, I have like a, like a six step, it's a it's a five step process for for every song. I I, I call it a six step process because the first step is coffee, um, mm -hmm. uh, but it's essentially a five step process uh, that I employ for every time I sit down to write a track, no matter what genre or style it is. It's a checklist. Um, so I'm going to share that. That's coming out next week. Um, that is 
my yeah my process is like okay i, I don't i don't want to like outline that whole thing right now because i'll you know i'll yeah. leave i'll leave it for the video but um it's it's essentially the the, the idea is two things um that are are absolutely integral to the process which is one is just organizing and getting organized uh and this and the other is like is creating a blueprint for the track um rather than going like you know bar for bar uh adding all the little details in one piece at a time it's all about and i mean so so the, in, in, in in essence the entire thing is about is like an organizational um way of approaching songwriting uh and i think that it's really important to create a blueprint uh, to to work with, um, Do that's you start my start with a template. Any kind of template. My my in, templates in are very my templates are very minimal. They're very very minimal. Like I I know that people go really crazy with the templates, especially those of you who are writing like orchestral like and uh, trailer music and stuff well, like that. So I know the templates can go deep. That might be different. It, and mean, there's you... a necessity for that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, I, I my templates like. You know, I don't even get into so much like into the routing thing with the templates and stuff. It's basically just the sounds that I know I'm going to use in any particular genre are preloaded in a template. Um, and then beyond beyond my template, I have a ton of saved tracks, track settings in Logic. Um, and these are all just, you know, uh, 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 they're just like quick presets for uh you know for sounds that i like in omnisphere or like you know one patch in particular that i like in some spitfire library you know it's like they're just quick like you know one click um uh routes to getting that sound loaded up sure. in contact sure. quickly that's that's all i do I, I know some people go um you know they, they their templates go as far as like having all the all the mastering plugs on the on the you know on the stereo out channel and the routing is all like you know uh, 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 predetermined and stuff like that and that's totally cool i think i think templates is a very subjective uh, thing and, and whatever works for you it works for me what works is just like to, to is to leave that aspect out of it and then just have like the sounds like if i'm writing a lo-fi track then i have like you know my uh, my keys like my certain like keys uh sounds that i uh, that are go-to sounds for me um yeah. i have like some um some contact libraries that have all like my kicks and my snares like preloaded and everything like that um yeah that, that and that's as far as it goes like what, what about you like what's your what's your template process my right. template is a software instrument and a vocal and a audio thing and that's it that's super or, super that's minimal i used to have a piano an easy drummer and a trillion and and those were the three because i always you know i i, I usually outline with a piano or a keyboard first since i'm a keyboard player and then i would play in oh actually no it was keyboard and then a uh, stylus which is a loop of some kind and then easy drummer and trillion and and trillion is a bass uh, plug-in from mm -hmm. spectrosonics and that was my template because I usually use those to, to start any pop thing for a client or whatever. Right. But I just found that everything was starting to sound vanilla. Everything was starting to sound the same to me. And uh, at, when I really got back into composing full time and started focusing on creating lots of different genres for, for sync and stuff, I just said, I'm not using it anymore. I'm just gonna call up a, a, this two track template in logic and it is a, an audio uh, a software instrument and an audio channel and that's all that's there and that's what i start with now usually i still start with piano sometimes if i'm doing a corporate thing or if i'm doing something that i want to have a different sound maybe i'll use some other sound and it could be a a, a native instruments guitar patch you know type of thing where i'm wanting to create a folk thing or i'm wanting to create something that has guitar feel mm -hmm. first but usually piano or electric piano comes into play at some point on a lot of my productions just because that's what I play. Like you play right. guitar, right. I play piano and, and electric piano most of the time. Um, I use Keyscape and Ivory for my pianos. If we're, I, I don't know if we're getting into software yet. But, uh, and then I use Easy Drummer for my guitar stuff. I mean, for my <laughs> drum stuff. And uh, I could probably upgrade to Superior Drummer. I just don't think that the upgrade is that important, especially since... On my higher end stuff, I hire real drummers. So um, yeah, we should I, well, well we should talk more about the, the go to sounds um, okay in a minute. Good. But because I, I just wanted to ask you uh, while I before while I have it in my mind, um, 
in terms of like the like going back to the process uh like if you like you say like take me through the 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 process of you writing um a track like you have a few instruments loaded like you said in like a ba very basic template um and then do you kind of sketch out the track using like one of those instruments in the piano and like kind of have it all arranged before you start adding all the bells and whistles and stuff yeah i usually play the piano all the way down right right when i'm writing a song if it's got piano in it or whatever the first instrument is i don't usually work in loops um, I used to back when I started, when mm. in, in my early days of sequencing, like in the 90s or, or early 2000s, I would create a lot on sequencing because one of the keyboards I had what had a sequencer on it, and uh, I could use I could use Cakewalk back then. I didn't have I, I did have Logic on the PC. This yeah, I used, I used Cakewalk at one point, and I used Cakewalk, and then I got into Logic on the PC, and I had a free version of Logic. Back there was a free version of Logic at one point. It was just a sequencer. It didn't have any. Plugins, of course, you couldn't do plugins back then anyway. But <laughs> yeah. um, it was just a sequencer, which works almost exactly the same as now. One of the great things about Logic is it still has quantization that you can take off, and it's never destructive. Right. It's it's always been like that since the '90s. So uh, I started using I I, I fell in love with that because I use MIDI all day long, every day. So um, yeah, my. Uh, my thing is to play down whatever the first instrument is all the way through the song, especially if it's piano. I'm just going to write the whole thing and play it all the way through the end. Mm -hmm. And um, and now sometimes I might start, though, saying I need some kind of groove. So I'll develop a loop that uh, out of, you know, somewhere and uh, pull a few things together and come up with the kind of the feel that drives the groove of my of my playing whether it's electric piano piano guitar type of thing whatever and that sometimes with a guitar you don't need it because guitar a strumming type of program or whatever or if you're playing acoustic guitar that kind of does its own and same with piano it's a th both of those are have a lot of percussion to them as instruments yes. so you can sometimes like if you decide to play a guitar part all the way through with acoustic guitar mm -hmm. you could do that and and you could you could speed it you could get louder and get softer and do all those kind of things because it's got its own dynamics built into it. Piano right. has the same thing, so um, that's an easy way. For that. But I I just I think through the whole song first. I design it and then I say okay this is going to be intro verse chorus verse chorus um, then a bridge and then chorus and I like to play through the whole thing and have the performance done that way. To me, that's the first level of doneness. It's it's all the way through. You know, all I have to do is fill in now. I have to play drums over the top of that. I have to add bass to that. I have to add ear candy to that or guitar to it, or I got to send it to a guitar player. Right. And I also have two different ways of producing something, by myself and with players. So if by myself is just going to be, it's usually the same process. I start with the key stuff, develop it all the way out, and then I've got to add drums, bass, and guitar in that order. And so I've either got to do that myself with, with my programs, or I've got to send it out to Nashville and send it to a bass player, I mean a drummer, and then get that that back, and then yeah. send it to a bass player, and then get that back, and then send it to a guitar player. And it takes a while, it, depending on their schedules, but you end up with a really nice production that's super dimensional because you've had three, four different people play on it, just like a live band tracking session. And that's another part thing that I do sometimes. Sometimes I just have live tracking sessions in Nashville and I will send them a demo and they don't use anything I do. And they totally create it from scratch with four players. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> so that, that is also something that uh, that's, that's another way I produce for me and my clients so a lot of my stuff that's in sync libraries right now was produced that way. You know, we're uh, just a, an actual session in Nashville produced with top players and an engineer in a studio. So that's still uh, a, a certainly a way I do it. So there's three ways. I do it all myself. Hmm. I do it myself plus I add separate players. And then the third way is just a tracking session in Nashville with all the players playing that day. And then on top of that, uh, of the tracking session, <clears throat> I may come in and then add more stuff to it. You know, and just kind of, sometimes uh, I'll replace the keys that the guy did or I'll add to the keys that the guy did or whatever. Or I'll say, I'll go to the guitar player and say, hey, you, could you add this one too, this part too, and all that kind of stuff. So very a, cool. lot of, a lot of different ways. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, we have a similar uh, approach um, in terms of how we, how we think about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely, I mean, so much about the music that I write is loop-based. 
Um, and the loop is a, is just a fantastic way to sort of figure out what the vibe and the feel um, of the track is going to be through through the established you know vibe of that loop. Um, I just use that uh, that block as uh, as a you know as a building block to to create the arrangement of the track, um, and and from there uh, it's you, you know and the and the, the and the creating the loop part of the track is is where I'm throwing all the ideas at the track, um, and I'll almost always end up taking something away. You know, I usually end up throwing too much um, at the wall, and then uh, yeah, using that block of uh, whatever loop for eight bars usually. I'll just um, I'll create the arrangement using that loop, um, and then uh, and then add all the bells and whistles and everything. That's the last step, you know, just adding the ear candy, like you like you said. Um, so that's yeah, it's a similar um, it's a similar approach. I definitely like to perform the, the the parts like through like through the whole track, like you were saying you do with the piano. I do that with the guitar as well, um, and I think that's important. I try not to punch in uh, individual sections. Um, I like to just actually perform it and I'll do that with the keyboard too. I'm not, a, I'm not a pianist, but, um, you know, the, with the guitar, I'll, 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 like, I'll have, once I figure out what the arrangement is, I'll get rid of the, the demo guitar and I'll just, I'll just perform throughout the whole track. Um, and that's often the way I like to work. If that doesn't work, if it, or if it's too difficult to do that, then I'll, then I'll punch in parts. But, um, yeah, that's, the, it's interesting to hear how people work. I think people get really bogged down than- in the process, but, um. It's it's a matter of being organized, you know. I wish more than anything I played guitar because that would help so much in even just having a guitar and having guitar sounds like an acoustic guitar. I probably should just have an acoustic guitar, not necessarily to play all the chords on it, but to just add some. Just you can just do one chords, you know. Yeah, just some single chord strums. It it is one of the 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 huge advantages of being a guitarist is that. It's easy. It's relatively easy for me to fake um, play piano, and it's very difficult for pianists to fake play guitar because Absolutely. even even as much as like the the you know native instruments strummed guitar is pretty pretty damn good, um, mm-hmm. it's 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 still impossible like for for uh, that, that technology to capture like the raw um, feeling and like you know uh, of playing guitar. The guitar is very raw. Um, so I have fooled some that. guitar players though. They're like, I've sent the guitar players. I said, "Hey, would you replace this guitar part?" And he goes, "Dude, that guitar sounds fine." Right. <laughs> that acoustic strumming, it sounds good. I mean, he could tell it's like loopish, but he says it it sounds fine. Let me just add electrics over this. And yeah, well, it's it's right all about in. masking it properly because, you, yeah. and that's what the cinematic folk course that I did was all about. It's about masking that because if you if you just send it in like as is like if, if it's just bare like it, like we don't have any dressing on on the uh on the like the acoustic strummed vst it's like it sounds pretty pretty gnarly but uh <laughs> if you dress it up then you won't notice it's pretty it's you can mask it a bit and in the reverse if i have a total midi session with midi piano midi drums and midi bass yeah but i add real guitars like acoustic, real acoustic guitars, yeah. suddenly everything else sounds real. Totally. And yeah. uh, especially if you know how to play drums like a drummer mm-hmm. on Easy Drummer or whatever program you're using, yeah. as long as you know how to play drums and bass uh, enough that, and bass is not, you can be pretty simplistic in bass. You don't have to be super, you don't have to do a lot of acrobatics in a bass, in a bass guitar part if you have a decent bass sample. And, and and actually, bass is not a big deal because there's all sorts of synth bass being used on every song, every kind of music. These yeah, days. if you know how to blend that synth and like like I use the like I I love playing my like uh, my bass lines like it with my actual P bass. Um, uh, so I I tend not to use much in terms of bass uh, bass VSTs, but the, I use the the, the Scarby Rickenbacker um, mm-hmm. bass VST. Uh, for if I if I do choose to try to like emulate a real bass sound, it sounds pretty good. But I find it really difficult to, um, in the same way with the acoustic guitar of VSTs, it's very difficult to emulate the that real vibe. You know. Yep. Well, well let's dive into our uh, into our, our go to sounds. Should I should I start okay. this off? Because I'm I'm curious. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't even know where to start. I think it, it really depends on the genre, right? But um, in, in terms of uh, drums. Because that's something that people talk about a yeah, lot. It's like, what kind drums. of drums VSTs are you using? Um, I started with Superior Drummer back in the day, and I've moved since over to being um, uh, almost exclusively uh, an addictive drums user. Um, I love their kits. I've got almost all of them now. 
You're addicted. I'm addicted. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they, they, they suit me just fine. Um, if it's lo-fi stuff, then like my essential plugins are the Wolf compressor, uh, by good Hertz, um, RC 20 by XLN audio who also makes addictive drums. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, like both of those are just essential. Um, I, I use, there's a few keys patches from Omnisphere that I really, really love. Um, I'll lean on pretty heavily for lo-fi and, uh, and like, yeah, I just, you know what people, the, there's a lot of discussion. There was some discussion in the Academy recently about, um, using splice for loops and stuff like that. And I, and I don't want to dive down that rabbit hole. Um, but you know, take out loops from the equation. Splice is just like a treasure trove of like the best kicks and snare samples. Um, I've collected just an arsenal of, of amazing, you know, kicks snares that I use and I, I put them into contact samplers and I use them in my lo-fi uh, tracks. And those are, are often my go-to drum kits, like alone. I don't, I won't even use addictive drums. You know, I'll just use these, uh, these kick and snare samples that I find uh, and hi hats um, as well from, uh, from splice. And, and that's a fantastic uh, resource, you know, for one shots, forget the loops. The one shots from splice is a fantastic uh, like addition to, um, some of the lo-fi stuff uh, I've been working on, um, or orchestral stuff. I, I mean, I, I'm kind of a Spitfire fanboy. I mean, uh, people know that I, I like, I have some audio Imperia stuff. Uh, you know, I, I love uh, performance samples as well. Um, but in terms of like the, the detail and, uh, for the kind of like softer, um, articulations like Spitfire, I think is kind of unrivaled, um, in that, in that domain. Um, and I love, I love, you know, my Spitfire libraries, the, the, the chamber strings are just absolutely unbelievably beautiful. I just picked up the Apassionata strings, uh, the Abbey Road 2 strings. They're just great libraries, man. These are amazing string libraries. I mean, I could just go on and on, but, uh, and I will I'll, and I'll, and I'll let you talk about it in a, in a minute, but, um, percussive stuff is, 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 is something that I've invested quite in a, uh, quite a bit in as well. D damage, uh, Hans Zimmer percussion, um, uh, audio Imperius Cerberus. I, uh, those are, those are kind of my go-tos, uh, right now. I, I, for, for, for cinematic percussion, I'm probably missing a few too. Uh, Heaviosity's ensemble drums. Um, those are some of my favorites. Well, and I, I'm an Omnisphere fan. I, I've, I've kind of like, I'm not a super stoked on a lot of Omnisphere stuff, but there's a few go-to sounds from Omnisphere that are really, really useful, especially with the keys. Um, they have a great selection of keys and organs and pads. You know, mine is is a lot more is a lot simpler than yours um, because I I produce um, because I do use oh son of ox that's what it is um, because I do use so much of players and or programmers in Nashville who do uh, a lot of programming for me especially on higher end sync stuff and I talked about this today in my live a little bit but. Um, on my, I think of everything that I do here by myself as a, not lower quality, but a different type of production than I produce with in Nashville. Only because you can't help but be more dyna um, dimensional with other people involved. So if I'm getting a bass player involved or a real drummer involved who's going to bring me real percussion, who's going to, I get a guitar player involved who's going to give me lots of different um, flavors of and or shades of, of color through different uh, types of guitar instruments and a, and or a, a keyboard player who's going to do keys and not play not play like me and he's going to give me different um, uh, other kinds of things perhaps string patches or pads or things he may not use the same things I use so to me that's a different level than me just creating something here all by myself and, um, but if I do create by myself, I start with usually like piano. And if I start with piano, I'm using Keyscape from Spectrosonics. And mm -hmm. I am, a, I am, that's what I'm a fanboy of is Spectrosonics. I mean, Spitfire too, why not? How could you not? But uh, Spectrosonics is, if I didn't have my four Spectrosonics tools, I could not work. I could not do what I do. I mean, I would, it, I could do it. It just wouldn't be as easy because Keyscape is my piano and it didn't always wasn't always this way and sometimes I still go back and use ivory and I think Keyscape and ivory are the two top 
piano emulators. Now, p some people would say piano tech is up there as well, mm -hmm. but w they they really only, especially Ivory, only concentrate on piano. They're not like also doing orchestral things and stuff. Now, Spectrosonics obviously does other things, and um, but Keyscape was designed to have that piano be a very malleable. Um, Yamaha piano that can go a lot of different ways. And I happen to prefer Yamaha piano on most things I play because if you're in Nashville and you go to a studio, there's going to be a Yamaha C, uh, C5 or whatever, C3 piano there. Mm -hmm. And and that's the sound of studios, even probably in, in LA as well. A Yamaha piano is the studio piano sound right. on most contemporary studios. Um, I, I've been in a studio that had a Steinway and it was oddly out of place. It was a beautiful Steinway Grand, but it just didn't, it never fit in pop tracks. It never fit in contemporary tracks, classical and all that kind of stuff. Sure. But otherwise it was always just odd. And, and Ivory has a Steinway and it has a Bosendorfer and it has a Yamaha. And I, I just gravitate to the Yamaha. And so when I got Keyscape, it took me a while to figure it out. But now it's all Keyscape all day. So, and, and so with Keyscape, is like, it just like one sam one piano, or and with a ton of presets, or are they sample like multiple it, different? It's, it, it's one piano, I think, but it's very malleable in its sound. You can really right. change its 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 sound, its its brightness, its uh, tone, its uh, effects all sorts of stuff and e all the presets have a different sound to them and then it also comes with uprights and it comes with a two or two of the best electric pianos that you'll ever find cool uh Rhodes type pianos and then a, and then it comes with a uh a100 or a200 um uh Whirly, you know sounds it has all the the main keys you need which is uh important to me from that perspective but the second big key ingredient for me with spectrosonics is stylus and stylus is kind of old technology and it's so old technology that a lot of people aren't using it anymore so i i kind of like still use it i just turn stuff around and i combine a lot of loops and i'll usually also pull loops from native instruments stuff and combine that with stylus and make my loops because the lo you were talking about loops don't think i don't use loops every single song Every single song has a loop somewhere in it. Yeah. It's just I'm not I'm not using a four bar loop and coming up with the song and then a four bar loop for the B section and then, you know, copying those and then playing over them. I, I, I do sometimes with corporate sometimes you have to. But I don't do that necessarily much. And um and so I start I always have some kind of loop that I'm playing Keyscape or Ivory or whatever keyboard I'm playing too. And then after that, I'm going to fill in as a, I'm going to just think like I'm at the studio. Who would I hire next? A drummer to play the drums to the key thing. You could, you could go to bass next, but it's odd. Bass needs that kick drum to play to. It can't play right. to a piano. It, it needs to know where the kick is. Yeah. So you have to go to drums next. And for me, I've just always used Easy Drummer. I have a lot of kits for it. Um, I, can, I change the kick and or the snare. Uh, from different uh, kits that I have for it as needed for the particular song. Like folk requires a bigger, like more open kick a lot of times, you mm -hmm. know, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I'll change that snare. Sometimes if it's a jazz thing, it needs a brushier thing. Um, but Easy Drummer is the thing I use. I also started using Slate Drums Free. When I did my free special, I downloaded that as a dang good little kit. It's a really great kit. I, I feel like it's, it's, uh, it's suitable for like rock um yeah it kind of has that rock vibe to it uh it wouldn't work for for all types of genres but man it is a great free kit yeah great free kit yeah. and um i also find that uh logic but also native instruments has uh, in the complete there's some really nice drum kits in there that's right well. yeah they're a little bit i don't know if maybe it's probably my computer but uh they're a bit wonky they sometimes they like uh they get a little sketchy on me uh those drum libraries but anyway yeah that's that's yeah, true so that's where I am with drums. And then uh, bass is Trillion. And yeah. they just updated Trillion last year and did a huge update, especially to the acoustic basses, which I use all the time. And so fantastic upright acoustic basses. But nice. even their basses and their fretless, they did a lot of work to them. And so uh, I, have, I fool engineers on a regular basis with my bass sounds. Yeah, and right. And bass playing, 
you just have to be careful not to do some things that keyboard players want to do, uh, little trills and, and little you know things that basses don't actually do. And basses <laughs> call me out on that all the time. But um, <laughs> I've always used Trillian. I do enjoy the Scarby stuff, though, on Native Instruments. Yeah, do, Scarby do, stuff do. It ain't bad. No, it's all pretty good stuff. Um, we sh I should uh, I should have mentioned synths uh, too, like uh, in terms of like the, the the key stuff I have. Like I, I use my Arturia um, collection, which I think is great. Um, the, J that. the Jupiter Eight, uh, the CZV, the DX Seven, uh, Mini Moog. Uh, those are uh, those are all synths I use a lot on uh, on on the on all genres, lo-fi, uh, indie, uh, pop stuff like that. Those are great. Um, I feel like Omnisphere though is has almost all of that that you would need. And, and there's no way you could ever really use all of Omnisphere. It's so huge. It's gigantic. A lot and of it, it. A lot of it is is like, yeah. Like I agree. They had. They do. Like they have some sample. You know, um, some Juno sounds in there, uh, and and some like more vintage, like uh, classic synths. Moves um, and stuff. But um, I mean, yeah. I mean, you certainly get a, a lot of options with that Arturia uh, uh, package. I, I've also I've actually thought about the next keyboard I get if I don't keep this one, um, is is trading this in and getting the um, the Arturia, um, eighty eight one that they have, and uh, because it comes with a bunch of Arturia software that I'd love right. I'd love to have like Native Instruments came with this, but um, mm -hmm. uh, and then for everything else past Omnisphere and strings and stuff like that I use. Every, you know, I, I made the investment into Native Instruments and fully up, went up to thirteen and yeah, all same. the things there. And so I have all the, I have a lot of the guitars. I bought the nylon guitar as we talked about, and that mm -hmm. that's really nice. And then the, the acoustics. I have all the strummed acoustic ones and strummed electric ones. And, um, and then as far as strings and stuff go, I I have the free um, um, BBC Orchestra version, which I find good for. Yeah. patty type things yeah it's not very good for you know super parts because it's so so much room and then uh i'm gonna start using logic more to be honest yeah i mean you. you combine logic's orchestral stuff with bbc symphony orchestra discover and uh and uh pen uh you know project sam's free orchestra and man you got yeah. like you can do some pretty amazing and stuff I have with that. all that that and then i also have some cheap sonovox strings that i uh, uh Orca, winds, brass, and string uh, ensemble things that I have. And they, I, I truly believe that the best way to come up with great orchestral sounds is to combine different libraries together. Mm, and agree. so using all three of those, uh, plus the native instruments ones I have now, the session strings and things like that. Yeah. And then now I got that Spitfire intimate strings. Wow, that's so useful cool. as far as patty, uh, type of uh, of close mic string. So, putting all that together, I can fake it pretty well. And heck, I faked it pretty well with Logic by itself last week. So, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but I did this one thing. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You what's that? Um, I did this one thing for this uh, oh, yeah. for this challenge with a bunch of strings. <laughs> <laughs> you'll never you'll never stop reminding me. If you're wondering why I keep referring to that, is because <laughs> you know I'm just giving him a hard time. But anyway, no, seriously, uh, I, I I know now a lot more about strings and logic, and and will use them yeah. for orchestral programming along with the other things that I have, and I think that's enough, you know. And then there's tons of native instrument stuff I haven't even gotten to yet that comes with it, packs, expansion packs, and um, just all sorts of things that. Um, I haven't had time to really even get into yet, uh, including and labs. I could you could spend. I think you know you've done some stuff with labs. And, oh yeah, uh, tons of stuff. And, and uh, what's the other one? What's the other free stuff? The piano, piano book. book stuff. Yeah, between so, sorry, piano book. Yeah. Yeah, p between piano book and labs, man, you can create some amazing stuff. Uh, yeah, they're both the they they're both just wonderful. It's a, it's so nice to have those resources. Um, if you don't, uh, you know, have the budget to dish out for some of these, uh, you know, um, expensive sample libraries, because they get so expensive. Um, and you know what? I like now that I'm sort of trying to remap my whole, uh, you know, computer situation here. Like I was going through the list of all the contact libraries. And I'm like, man, I don't, I don't really use a lot of these anymore. You know, so like I kind of have to trim it down a bit. Um, 
I, and, I would say I haven't downloaded half of what Complete has. Yeah, see, so, like, there's some of Complete I that I don't space. have. That, yeah, and some of it is so like takes up so much space, and some of it I'm just you not know? interested in. But <laughs> like, yeah, I, I finally downloaded Noir. Oh man, which Noir is, is their great. I, sh- I should I want always shout out Noir because like that man. It's that not is, bad. It's hard to dig into, so it's only good for certain things. You know, I think it'd be great for like felt piano stuff. That's what and, I mean. It's like it's amazing like, for. Know, for for felt um and getting like i don't know i i've been using it a ton on like the lo-fi and the cinematic stuff yeah, that i've been doing sure, the more absolutely. like the kind of quieter chill stuff it, it's really really nice i wouldn't use it for yeah i don't know i couldn't get, use it for pop or rock or yeah anything like pop that, or rock it's maybe not the best option yeah but it's good it's very <clears> good <throat> so yeah and i'd love to experiment with all those unicorda is another one that's interesting unicorda is cool and, uh, yeah the 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 grandeur and the yeah. gentleman and all those. There's a lot that I just haven't had time and or space on my drives to download to. So um, there's so much and, and we're so rich in sounds these days. I mean, free to even if you buy something like Complete, which is not that expensive for everything it offers or if you have Logic, there's so much opportunity out there. You have to dig sometimes. And, and another process of mine, I will just say like, for this project that I did um, for for this thing on Logic, I had to really go in and find, okay, I, I want something electron. And I would just go in and I just went in and I said, okay, which of these sounds have I not used before? You know, like mm-hmm. uh, which which sound have I, have I never opened this plugin of Logic has? You know, uh, right. session horns. Or uh, well, it's not a session horns. It's called something else. Session horns is native instruments, but you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. They have different um, plugins inside of Logic, and I tried some I'd never used before. Mm-hmm. And uh, to me, that was the fun of of of. That's sometimes the fun of doing projects. I mean, it's great to have an arsenal that you use all the time, but it's also great to go in and find something you've never used and try to do that for every song. Totally. Every song. Totally. Find one thing you've never used before and put yeah. it in. Right. That's such a that's such a great point, yeah, totally. Yeah, a few a few um just thinking about it, like a few other like kind of uh uh you know plugins that I sort of feel like I I've just been so essential to um to helping me out with uh, with with leveling up the the quality of my productions is uh is the SSL um Waves SSL bus compressor and uh, and my Ozone uh, mastering software is just so good. It's just so. It's amazing. It's just amazing stuff. I'd love to have Ozone proper. I've got the free version. Mm-hmm. And it by itself is a great, yeah, easy master. If you just don't have right. anything else, <clears throat> wait till a time they're, they're, putting it, they're selling it for $19 or something and pick up the free Ozone, uh, free isotope, isotope Ozone. Yeah. And you get, you get EQ, it kind of like does EQ for you. It does the, you know, and then you can... Uh, add the amount of compression you want in for the final bus. Yeah. And that by itself is a fine masterer for a lot of things. You and know, you now use I use waves. L2, right? Yeah. The L2 waves. I use limited multiband compression and then wait, and then L2 ultra, ultra maximizer right. from waves. I've been using those for 20 years. Probably. Classics. However long they've been out. Yeah. I've, I've been using them. They still work. They do all the work for me. I, I just, I don't even, it doesn't even take me much time to master So, uh, but I also mix as I go, you know, Daniel talks a lot about this when he talks about different, uh, production type of things for that. And I, I agree with it. It, You should be mixing as you go. You know, everything should be pretty locked in as you go. You don't need to go, well, when I get done with this arrangement, then I'll go back in and make the drums better or louder or stronger or compressed or whatever. I do all of that. So by the time I've put the last instrument in, I'm ready to mix. I, you know. I don't totally get bogged down with the the mix. I, I limit myself because I, I think it's uh, and it, it sort of depends on the genre too. But I I do a very light mix as you go. I do a very light, and then I get into much more detail when the song is is composed and completed. Uh, then I do like a like a like a, a final revision mix. So I have kind of two mixing stages. One is sort of as I go, just a little bit. Um, but, and then, and then the nether, the last one is like a, is like a final mix and master. You know what I mean? 
I keep L2 on like all the time, like even right now. And when you get this vocal, it'll have L2 on it, which is, and I'll decide how much it needs on it before I send it to you. But it's always on just a little, so it never peaks, mm. you know? And so it, uh, it's not very strong on, but it's, I call it initial L2. And it's just a, it's a, it's, Again, it's part of my template, and so it's always in there. So wherever I'm playing piano and adding loops and adding drums and stuff, if anything ever starts to peak, then everything is way too loud. And that, so, But that never really happens because I know where my volumes are and should be, and I have it controlled by a limiter the whole time mm -hmm. you know, on the, on the external bus. But that's the only external bus limiter I have on while I'm working is that L2, is that right. ultra maximizer. And, on a, and it's only set very small so that it just won't let anything get too loud, you know. Yeah, I'll often work with a bus compressor just lightly on, on the stereo channel, but uh, I won't have any mastering. I won't work with the ozone on uh, on uh, at all. That's no. always kind of the last step. I can't. I can't work with limited multiband compressor because there's, there's too much latency. So, exactly. Uh, yeah, I, there's a latency like issue. They, so if I get the whole thing done and I've got mastering applied and it's all great and I decide to add something, I have to go back and take off the L2, uh, the limited multiband compressor because it to it perform something else. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's a problem for sure. So yeah, man, that's my that's that's the way I I have produced for the last 20, uh, 20 years, especially since I went to Nashville. It's it's a very top down or bottom up, you could say, drums, uh, you know. For initial instrument, drums, bass, guitars, candy. And uh, that's just, that's to me, that's a natural way to produce. And yeah. uh, as, a, as a programmer who then sends stuff to players and or sends it to have stuff be tracked to it or tracks all the things myself, that's the way I think of it and stack it. You could think of it as top down from a sequencer point of view, but, you know, anyway. Yeah, well, I think that if, it, if there's anything to take away from this episode, it's just like, you know, it really, we really don't use a, a whole lot. I mean, both of our setups are, are very, very simple. Mm -hmm. um, and I really don't think that, yeah, the equipment that you have uh, is, a, you know, is going to be a reflection on your success with, with you know, sync licensing um, and, uh, you know, what kind of income you're bringing in from, from music. I mean, you can do it with an extremely minimal setup. I mean, even thinking Dude, back to our, our bud, our bud Lester, you know, who's, who's, who's working with a laptop and his guitars in an RV. I mean, he's killing it. Um, you don't need much, right? Like you just, you just don't need much. I've met people who make incredible garage band things on a phone or on an iPad. Yeah. And they don't have anything but garage band and the sounds in garage band. Sometimes they're not even players. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it just depends on your creativity. It, it depends on your- So much. How, how much you are willing to put into it and the time that you will take Yeah. and all of that, so. Yeah, invest in your creativity. Don't invest in equipment. That, that, that can come later. I mean, I think yeah. it's like it's with playing guitar, it's like, you know, if you're just deciding to, to start learning how to play guitar, you don't go buy a $5,000. Uh, Les Paul, you know, start start yeah. with like a used beater and then work your way up. <laughs> it makes more yeah. sense to me. And start with a good DAW. You know, I mean, I know Pro Tools is is uh, attractive and it's an, the industry standard for mixing and tracking, but I don't think Pro Tools is the industry standard for composing. No, not I really. Think... It's it's yeah, it's it's amazing. But you're totally right. Pro Tools is a great for for tracking and it's great for editing. Um, but it is kind of like a, a studio DAW, you know, it's like a proper studio DAW. It's still kind of the standard for like the, the bigger studios, um, for it's live absolutely tracking. the standard in Nashville still. And, yeah, yeah. uh, I will get, I will get pro tools session files from everybody who sends me stuff, but well, we I had, we had a couple of members to, to hand in the, their stuff with, uh, with pro tools for the challenge. And it was pretty damn good. Like uh, one of the members was saying that they'd really up their game with the, uh, with the stock, uh, stock plugins, especially, but I don't think that stock sounds has ever been their, um, their strong. No, point. And actually MIDI wasn't even their thing until about five years ago. I mean, you could, you could, you could barely do any MIDI very well on that. Over, it's gotten better over the last 10 years, but boy, for a while it was, yeah, it's pretty it was rough. Really? Yeah. It was Lo really Logic rough. has always been that has always taken that kind of user friendly, um, composition friendly approach for, and they, that's always been and their cakewalk. thing. Cakewalk. Mm -hmm. Cakewalk was one that really never survived into, uh, uh, the, the pro ranks. 
Yeah. Um, they developed sonar, which was like the next step uh, past cakewalk. That's and right. I used that for a while as well until yeah. I, f I finally got to the point. Where I just had an engineer who used Logic all the time, and to work with him, which was become a, which became a daily thing. I had to, you know, make the switch to Logic, and I've never come back. But um, yeah, Cakewalk, and there's a there's a version of Cakewalk that is free by Band Labs that I talked about in my free tools uh, video, and it's very good, and a lot of people use it, and I think it might even come with some instruments. It's called it's by a company called Band Lab bought out Cakewalk, and they now offer it as a free DAW. And so if you don't have one, I, now I don't know what kind of instruments come with it. I think some do, but I, I haven't really experienced that. And, I, and obviously I know things like, uh, the other one is that you, were, you talked about and somebody used was um, uh, Studio One. Studio, <clears throat> Studio One. Studio One is, is, yeah, it's become pretty legit. Studio One's like next to Logic, is like underneath Logic, I think, as the as maybe the up and coming platform. And Ableton a lot, is a lot there of people too. using it. And, and we should, and we can't forget about FL Studios. It's just funny because I can. Um, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> whether you like it or not, it's uh, it, it, there is a ton of it, people but... using FL Studio, and it's they've upped their game big time. Uh, know, back when I on. first like the and it's funny because the first sequencer that I I ever used was Fruity Loops, which is the precursor to sure. FLS, and that yeah. was back in the in the late nineties, um, and uh, yeah, that was that was the first DAW that I ever got into. And we're gonna have to do a DAW episode and just like do a huge, um, uh, a huge uh, poll as big as we can get as large as we can get and find out what everybody is using ableton fl a, studio logic that's that's got to be the top three or the, and, and the order, orchestral guys are using Q, Q, uh, cubase um and studio one i mean uh, everybody i mean and, and including pro tools users including the uh, uh people who are using studio one and and things like that I, it, it would just be great to to see okay like even go to all my Nashville guys and go to all my players and go to all the, you know, the pros and all the way down to home enthusiasts and yeah. everything in between, yeah. you know, and find out where, what are you using as your main DAW? So that'd be fun to do. And then just do the pros and cons of all those and get, get thoughts. That's a pretty interesting thing because that's a, that's our main tool. I mean, how else would we make it? We don't have any. It's recording, an instrument. Uh, it's kind of an stuff. instrument in itself, and it's it's yeah. yeah it's it's interesting how they're all unique and in, the, in their own ways, and they have they all have their kind of pros and cons. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're both Logic users, and I think we both agree that Logic is just a is a absolutely fantastic, well rounded DAW. Um, if it wasn't for Logic, if Logic didn't ex exist, I'd be an Ableton user. I would probably be in something like Cubase. I would imagine. Um, because or Studio One, uh, but Studio One's so new. I mean, it's only been out a few years, right? Yeah, I don't know if, uh, when it came out. Um, I have uh, the free version, but I haven't really yeah. uh, dug into it too much yet. Some stuff about Ableton I really like, but it's ta it takes a little bit of getting used to visually. Like the arrangement view is kind of uh, not as it's not great to look at, uh, not compared to Logic. Um, yeah, and here's what's weird about Ableton is. Um, <laughs> The everything is backwards from it's like everything's on the that's right, the yeah. Right. That's what's confusing about it. It's it's it takes so much to get. I have used one to. of my clients I work with, uh, you know, and he's using Ableton. He brings the screen up. I'm like, wait, 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 why is everything <laughs> over there? It's like Twilight Zone <laughs> for Logic users, <laughs> it's like backwards. <laughs> I mean, at least Logic and, and Pro Tools are both have everything over on the left side, you know, and, and then and, and then Ableton the, has the added clips thing which is like a like the secondary sort of window um, which is a totally yeah. different way to use it which is i think is cool it's a really interesting um sort of a, a, a loop, loop facet stuff, right? of, of ableton yeah it's very loop friendly right so well that's um, the way it started right yeah wasn't that it's very beginning was as a loop based type of thing i think so i don't know man um, good stuff yeah um if you haven't found anything in this episode to dig into then uh, I mean, we can't help you <laughs> if you're if you're a music maker and and making stuff we would love to know all of your uh feel free to put your setups in in the comments of this yeah. video or or in the you know get get in touch with us and let us know it's always interesting i i don't remember if i did a poll uh for this particular one on spotify but only a few people see that anyway so I'm right yeah well if you're, if you're watching on youtube uh please feel free to comment yeah. and uh, we'd love to hear from you and uh, let us know what's your doll and what's your, your doll? instruments 
Yeah. And your 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 favorite sounds. Yeah. For sure. I'd love to know those. But we'll we'll have to do a po- a poll on that and and really find out where the where the best peop where the best what the best one is what the most popular one is I should say maybe yeah so, for sure because we've just proved in your uh, latest one that almost any dog can produce great music by itself and go uh, listen so. go listen to the submissions if you guys haven't watched that live stream go listen to the submissions that some of these guys in my academy sent me and they're just mind blowing it really great. is mind blowing stuff. Really great, and then we'll have to listen to Eric some other time. <laughs> mm, my, poor, my poor piece, I, I slaved. <laughs> you so slaved much. for months, <laughs> waiting for, <laughs> waiting for your time, your moment. I actually may have spent more than one hour on it, so that's a lot of time. Actually, it's been two or three hours. It's about, it's about what okay, I spent Steve. on mine. It's okay. <laughs> I didn't really deliver a great submission uh, myself, but um, yeah, that's about what I spent on mine, about an hour, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, not bad for an hour, right? Yeah. Yeah, the time it takes to to uh, to create a track on average. No, that's another well, discussion. Quickly, Maybe let me like... just say that, you know, my, my current uh, process in as far as time seems to be three different little sessions. I start it, the starter right. session where I create the first little piece with, and sometimes it's just the piano part. And then the second part where I go in and fill in underneath that. And I listen to it first, say, is it any good? And then I fill in underneath it and add stuff. And then the third part where I go in and finalize it and say, all right, it's good enough. Let's put the last little bells and candy on it and, and, and print it out. So that's kind of my lately seems to be my process, especially for stuff that's going to stock, you know, it's, it's, or, or stuff that I'm just developing here by myself. You know, sometimes I, I can get things done really, really quickly. Like I can get a track finished in a couple hours or like even an hour and a half or something. Um, but I think the benefit of doing what you were talking about is that it's really helpful to come back to a track with fresh ears. Sometimes your ears get a little bit burnt out um, and you don't pick up on some problems in, in the mix. And so I think Occasionally, I will do what you you do as well, which is I'll put it down and I'll come back to it another day, um, and I'll always catch something that I just didn't notice uh, when when I was at the finishing line uh, from the previous session. So, um, but I think in total, like I try not to th- put too much more than like you know a handful of hours into each track. But sometimes they will get spread over uh, over a couple of days, like you said. Well, man, we better cut this one off because we've been we've been going a while. So. Um... Everybody, thanks so much for listening, and I hope that you found some nuggets in this and it's been helpful, and we'd love to know more about your setups, your processes, and your gear. Make sure you leave uh, some information for us. And with that, I guess that's going to be it. That's it. I hope you guys liked my my intro. I practiced for uh, for a week. you did a fine job. You're re- <laughs> See? You're good. You're, you want to do the outro? Oh, uh, no, I didn't practice okay. for the outro. Outro is all you. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks so much for listening and watching, and we'll talk to you next week. See you guys.